We've sailed to the Balearic Islands of Spain to see if we can still find warm, clear seas, quiet coves, and unspoiled historic towns in one of the most popular tourist destinations in the Mediterranean. I wanted to break away to see the world. I longed for excitement, the romance of travel. So we built a boat. And now we travel the oceans. Join us as we voyage to distant shores. Waves of invaders have fought to gain control of these shores. Since the Phoenicians 3,000 years ago, Carthaginians, Romans, Moors, Turks, and others have come and conquered or tried to. Now new invaders from Northern Europe have come, and they've already taken control of the beaches. On this leg of our journey into the Mediterranean Sea, Cheryl and I joined the invasion of sun-worshipping northerners to the hot sandy shores of Spain's Balearic Islands. Due to their strategic position in the western Mediterranean, close to the mainland of Spain, France, Italy and North Africa, the Balearic Islands have been invaded and conquered by many nations over the centuries. There are four main islands in the Balearics. To the east, Majorca and Menorca, and to the west, Ibiza and Formentera, our destination on this voyage. The ancient Romans who settled on Formentera 2,000 years ago called this island Frumentaria, or Wheat Island, since that was the primary crop grown here, but their farming efforts were frustrated by many invasions. Throughout its history, Formentera was plagued by pirate attacks and was eventually abandoned as indefensible following the decline of the Roman Empire. When the Spanish returned in the 17th century, they established the main town inland, centered around this fortified church, which the villagers used to defend themselves in the face of continuing pirate attacks. The residents even turned to piracy themselves occasionally, and in 1806 they captured the 12-gun British brig Felicity and sailed her over to Ibiza Harbour. Today's wave of invaders also come by boat to Formentera, but their quest is a peaceful one to enjoy the beautiful clear seas and relax on the golden beaches. There's no major airport on this island, so visitors flying in must land on the nearby island of Ibiza to the northeast and then take a ferry over. If they're sailors, they may choose to fly in and charter a yacht or, like us, sail their own boat a great distance from home to reach this paradise. Cheryl and I crossed the Atlantic Ocean from Canada aboard our classic 37 sailboat Two-Step to get here. We built Two-Step ourselves and are fulfilling a long-time dream of traveling the world in our own sailboat. No matter what your age, it's hard to be bored when you're cruising on a sailboat, especially when you're exploring such a beautiful island as Formentera. As Paul and I head for the next cove along the coast, we see an unusual looking village at the north end of the beach. It looks abandoned and appears to be built entirely of driftwood. Wow, it looks like someone has constructed some sort of a monument or a camp on shore just out of driftwood. Let's go take a look. But as we make our way over, we realize this camp is cleverly placed to deter invaders from sea. We're quickly surrounded by numerous reefs and shoals. What's the depth? 
It's pretty shallow. It's only about eight feet. We'll have to anchor well off the beach if we're going to investigate. Look at this! It is made out of driftwood. Someone has named this place La Riada, the Flood, which seems an appropriate name for a playground built totally from stuff that washes up on a beach. Old rope, floats, nets and pipes, wooden planks and skids, and cleverly added to over the years by island visitors and other passers-by. Well, there's always someone with a pirate's sense of humor. There's lots of natural things, too. Even a place to make your offering to King Neptune. I see someone's offered a package of seasickness pills. Hope that means he's been cured. There's something about this place that brings out the child in you. You forget your age and just want to play and make believe. As we're leaving to head back to our boat, we see that there's other treasure here too. There's all kinds of fresh seafood on the seashore. These are winkles, and we're going to pick a few so we can have them with cocktails in the cockpit. But we find so many, we decide to share them with our Norwegian friends aboard their boat, Mariton. Our friends love seafood, but they've never tried winkles. Alfgunner is about to cook up some mussels, so we combine our catch and I get some tips on preparing shellfish. And I want to see the shells, that they, if you look at them, it's a little bit open. Mm -hmm. And if I knock it a little bit, it's closed. So then it's very fresh and good. So that's a good sign. That's when a good you sign. tap it, it closes. Yes. Okay. But I find someone who, I knock them a little bit but they don't want to go close, so these are bad. Did you find these on the nearby shorelines here? No, I found them in a supermarket. All right. Yes. <laughs> That's the easiest place to find them. That's easy. We decide to cook up the winkles in the same sauce as the mussels and start with chopped garlic, leeks and onions. We are going to use a little bit of white wine. Oh, yum. We've come to the right restaurant here. Yes. <laughs> First, we have to wash the winkles. Wash the winkles? Boy, that's hard to say. And the word winkles is a tough one for our Norwegian friend. Well, we are going to take this. Winkles. Okay, sorry. Yes. Winkles. Winkles. I'll winkles. say it. I'll say it. Yes. Okay. But now it's catching. Hey, we've got some, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, rolling. Okay, we've got some boiling salted water. And what are we going to do with the winkles? We are going to drop them in the water about seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that we've got the words worked out, we can get down to cooking. When the winkles are done, we set them aside and use the same water to cook the mussels in. Just watch now. They're bubbling a little bit more. Is that what I'm supposed to be looking for? No, we have to wait a little bit more and see. Oh, look at this. Oh, you're, that is different from the cockles. All opened up. These ones are smiling. Yes. They seem to be happy. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to make the sauce. First, Alfgunner sautés the onion, garlic, and leeks in some olive oil, then adds a little white wine. Now we're adding some of the bouillon, the fish bouillon. 
It really yeah. smells great, the aroma yes. of the wine and the onions and vegetables and now this wonderful broth, your bouillon. You know, that's the thing I really enjoy about being on the boat is you have time to cook and mm. enjoy the company of nice people. Your cream. Cream. Now just a little salt and pepper. Oh, yes. <laughs> it does smell good, doesn't it? <laughs> Do we have to share this with the others? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, next step. Oh, doesn't that look pretty? So we have a lovely mix of the winkles that Paul and I found today and the mussels that you found in the supermercado. And uh, looks like we're going to have a feast. Yes. <laughs> Oh, wow. Dinner on Marathon is a gourmet affair. This is the first time I've eaten mussels this way. Okay, everybody, uh, here goes. I'm going to try this. So I just break it open. And then I just eat it right off the shell. Yes. yes. Mmm, really good. Looks good. Yes. And now for a lesson on eating winkles. Winkles are very small, so we're using just a pin to take them out. The first thing you have to do, there's this little round disc, a little bit like a contact lens, and that's a bit hard on your throat to eat. And then you just take the pin and Stick it in the little guy, and it just pulls out. Oh. <laughs> I think, Tanya. Don't even ask. <laughs> you don't like seafood? No. No. <laughs> what do you think, Paul? Oh, it's wonderful. This sauce really adds a lot to the to the flavor. Cause on Pretty their good. own, winkles are rubbery and tasteless. Mm. It tastes very nice, and it's free food. We found it right there on the beach. Our friends seem a little hesitant, but give the Winkles a try. What do you think? Not bad. <laughs> you won't eat it every day though, right? No. <laughs> but it's fun to try it. But we all agree, anything tastes good drenched in wine, rich cream, butter, and garlic. Well, skull. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this lovely meal. Thank, Thank you. Gordon Marathon. Are you interested in the cruising lifestyle? Are you planning to sail away on a cruising adventure? Or researching cruising areas and destinations? Distant Shores is a television series about the cruising life with lots of tips for sailors planning to sail away. This is Oswego, New York. We are entering the Erie Canal system and this will take us all the way from Lake Ontario to the Hudson River which gets us to New York City. Plus destination information to help you make your cruising plans. Yeah, I can stand on the bottom. We've been filming Distant Shores for nearly 15 years and know the fun and challenges of the cruising life. We've made distant chores with you in mind. We include plenty of cruising tips in this travel series, as well as lifestyle segments and hints for sailors heading to exotic destinations. Encouragement for you and your crew to get out cruising. Destinations include the Intracoastal Waterway, the Bahamas, Caribbean, the Mediterranean, Scandinavia, transatlantic passage making, the French canals, and more. The anchorage at the north end of Formentera with its beautiful Crescent Beach has become our favorite spot. 
Although it's exposed to winds from the west, we've been having such gentle breezes this spring that none of the yachts have had problems with their anchors dragging. But we suspect that in stronger winds, most anchors won't hold well in the churned up weedy bottom of this bay. We decide to do a test to determine whether it would be safe to remain in this harbor in a storm. For the time being, Two-Step is swinging happily at anchor, our 45-pound CQR plow buried in one of the few sand patches in the bay. With the help of our friends Tony and Tanya, we set up to do a test using our fisherman's anchor in the weeds that cover most of the bottom, since this is what the majority of boats are anchored in. Of the four types of anchors we carry on board, our fisherman's anchor should hold the best in weeds. Its long, narrow flukes are designed to dig through weeds and are less likely to get fouled with debris than some other designs. The weeds are deeper than they appear, so the anchor doesn't set, and when Tanya applies force by driving forward in the dinghy, it drags easily. Not good. In strong winds, boats in this crowded anchorage would be dragging into each other. If the winds are from the west, boats could be washed ashore. Out of curiosity, we decide to repeat the test in sand, which is usually hard packed and holds most anchors well. Uh-oh, it almost sets, but the sand is loose, churned up from the number of boats anchoring here. From this test, we feel there's no place our anchor will hold well in a storm. We'll warn the others and keep a careful eye on the weather. All is quiet in the anchorage and aboard the good ship Two-Step tonight. But the anchoring test we did today has got us worried. Looks like there might be some bad weather approaching, so we're tidying ship so we can set sail at first light if we need to. Well, it's been great here. We've had a wonderful time. But unfortunately, we've got a weather forecast that there's supposed to be a strong southwest to west wind coming. This anchorage is wide open to those winds. We've had problems getting the anchor to set. And I'm just concerned if we've got big winds and big waves in here, it could be quite dangerous. So we're going to move on and try and find a marina for the next couple days. Okay, let's go. I know it feels strange to be leaving today when the weather is so beautiful, but we've got a bad forecast and we have to take precautions. It's every sailor's nightmare to be up against the land with wind and waves pushing you towards the beach or rocks. It's called being caught on a lee shore. Although this is a lovely anchorage when the wind comes over the island, if the wind were to turn and build, we could be put right up on the beach. The tiny islands at the entrance wouldn't protect us, and what would be more dangerous, the relatively shallow water across the entrance could cause large waves to break, cutting off our escape route and trapping us inside in a storm. That evening, after tying two steps securely in the protection of Ibiza Town Harbour, the wind picks up from the south and approaches gale force. Then it swings around to the west and rises to a full storm. We're snug in our marina in Ibiza, but the anchorage in Formentera is completely exposed to the force of wind and sea. When we return to the anchorage two days later, we find a boat has washed up on the beach. We just returned to Espalmador. Uh, we left here on Friday because there was a bad weather forecast. And some of the boats that decided to stay had a rough time. Anchors were breaking loose. He could not get his engine started, but everyone's here to help. Just six boats chose to remain in the anchorage and weather out the storm. With one of them ending up on the beach, the others tell us about their experience. And I think they're almost euphoric to have survived. Sort of, it just, the whole turmoil just transformed it into some horrific film. <laughs> over the island, the water came over. <laughs> it was fantastic. From the earth to look. It was like hell let loose. You know, it was this beautiful island, beautiful bay. The wind turned a little bit and his anchor came out. He phoned on, on radio, channel 16, is there anyone that can help me? But 
they had all the same problems. Bank has slipped four times. We literally trolled around for about an hour and a half because we just in, within the bay because it was just too fierce to um, try and anchor. We just couldn't anchor. His anchor came loose and he had no chance. For one or two, two hours it came pong, pong, every wave. Yeah? The German captain tells me about his experiences in the storm. The waves kept picking the boat up and dropping it down on the sand further up the beach. They were so big, they threw sand and weeds right over the decks. <laughs> because we tried with several anchors and churning. 12 tons and 1 meter 40 the keel down the sand. That's an anchor for a big building. <laughs> Since the storm, the other sailors here have tried everything to get her off. The island is uninhabited, and even the nearby island doesn't have any salvage equipment. The local dive club have offered to try using some makeshift gear to pull her off, but there's a deadline. If they can't get the boat back in deep water by sunset, any winds overnight would just fill the sand back in and push her farther up the beach. Their strategy is to use a small outboard motor as a fan to blow sand out from around the hull. With probably more than a hundred tons of sand to shift, it doesn't seem likely this effort will even work. A bewildered crew member who weathered the storm with the captain isn't sure what to make of the whole thing. They try to to make a channel to to deep water. So one meter, one meter forty, it's enough. As the day goes on, the crew seems to be making very little progress. The outboards keep getting clogged up with sand. The workers are getting tired. The boat is still stuck hard on the beach and it starts to look like the effort won't work. But after a few more hours, they've managed to dig a hole around the yacht. Behind the yacht, enough sand has been shifted to create a whole new sandbank where there used to be a meter of water. Two and a half, three feet of water. The deep keels are still holding the boat in place though, an effort shift to breaking her free. Finally, the keels break out of the bottom and suddenly she's afloat in her own little lake. The dive club's small boat is hooked up to pull while the two dinghies are strapped alongside to continue shifting sand out of the way as the yacht finally heads back to deep water. It's very lucky that the captain built this boat strong enough to survive being pounded on the beach. There appears to be no more than a few scratches and thankfully no one was hurt. Resting gently at anchor tonight, it's hard to imagine the turmoil in this anchorage the night of the storm. Learning to read the weather and anticipating the effect a change in conditions can have on your location is an important skill when you're a sailor. Our boat is our home and a safe haven for us as we travel to foreign ports around the world, so we take weather watching seriously. Paul and I feel it's better to err on the side of caution rather than risk losing the freedom and good health we enjoy sailing aboard Two-Step. Life is short and there is so much of this beautiful world yet to explore.
Are you interested in the cruising lifestyle? Are you planning to sail away on a cruising adventure? Or researching cruising areas and destinations? Distant Shores is a television series about the cruising life with lots of tips for sailors planning to sail away. This is Oswego, New York. We are entering the Erie Canal system and this will take us all the way from Lake Ontario to the Hudson River, which gets us to New York City. Plus destination information to help you make your cruising plans. Yeah, I can stand on the bottom. We've been filming distant shores for nearly 15 years and know the fun and challenges of the cruising life. We've made distant shores with you in mind. We include plenty of cruising tips in this travel series as well as lifestyle segments and hints for sailors heading to exotic destinations. Encouragement for you and your crew to get out cruising. Destinations include the Intracoastal Waterway, the Bahamas, Caribbean, the Mediterranean, Scandinavia, Transatlantic Passage Making, the French Canals and more.